Hello everyone and welcome to Civic Platform. This is your host Zuhair Al-Mustri. Today I am covering this wonderful uh, exhibit behind me about the Queen Elizabeth II and Winnipeg uh, modern Elizabethan era. Uh, the Queen uh, Elizabeth, she visited Winnipeg six times uh, before and uh, every time she came um, she had a great time with the Winnipeggers. So let's find out more about this era and uh, more information in this uh, history for uh, Winnipeggers and how it's important uh, the Queen Elizabeth was uh, for uh, Winnipeggers. So let's find more details uh, from this exhibit and welcome for a new episode from Civic Platform. Hello Zohair, thank you very much for having me on the CEVIC program. My name is Daniel Gunther and I'm a researcher and curator with the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation. So the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation is a non-profit uh, organization here in the city of Winnipeg that is um, charged with pre um, advocating uh, for the uh, pr preservation and for the appreciation of architecture and the diversity of architecture that is found throughout the city of Winnipeg. So the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation is a very uh, special organization because the city of Winnipeg has some of the uh, most diverse styles of architecture in Canada. Uh, a lot of people might not know just how fantastic our architecture is here. We have everything from the very beginning of the city of Winnipeg, grand classical buildings such as here in Union Station, but we also have uh, many examples of architecture right through the years, including uh, modernist examples from the 1950s and the 1960s, postmodern in the 1980s, but also a lot of recent examples and a lot of just fantastic architecture that has been built by very proud local architects, many who were educated here at the University of Manitoba, which is also the third oldest architecture school in Canada. So the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation really wants to educate Winnipeggers to appreciate the fantastic architecture that we have. Yes, Winnipeggers can be very self-deprecating and generally our city, you know, maybe flies under the radar. It's not as big as some of the other Canadian cities, but we have some of the most fantastic architecture in Canada and it's about time that we started recognizing and appreciating that and that's the work of the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation is to help people appreciate and understand uh, the beautiful architecture that we have here in Winnipeg. I think returning a little bit to the past, when you look at the architecture during Winnipeg's real boom years, such as you know the early 1900s or even in the mid uh, the mid 20th century of the 1950s and the 1960s, we had governments that really invested in Winnipeg. They invested in our city, and they invested in very important projects that made it proud to be a citizen of Winnipeg. You know, you even look at the Manitoba Centennial Concert Hall, which is just a fantastic piece of architecture. It's a fantastic space. So I think there's a, a need to return to this idea that what we're building, we should be proud of and we should be, you know, very, very careful with what we're building. But when we do build something, do it right and do it well. So the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation was looking to do an exhibit on all the different styles of architecture during the reign of Queen Elizabeth II.
Queen Elizabeth II was Queen of Canada for over well, 70 years uh, that she was on the throne and we wanted to, to understand what the styles, what the predominant styles would be of the modern Elizabethan era. So just like we have the Victorian era, the Edwardian era, era the Stuart, the Tudors, you know, many of our eras are named after the monarchy. And so we wanted to look at what would the modern Elizabethan era look like. And when we started researching and digging into the different buildings that were built each decade during the Queen's reign, we really started to notice a pattern that the architecture that was built here is linked to the styles that were built elsewhere. So very international styles such as modernism, but they were tailored for the local Winnipeg uh, market and a lot of times they use local uh, Manitoba materials such as Manitoba Tindallstone which is a very famed product. The Manitoba Legislative Building is built out of Tindallstone, so is the Winnipeg Art Gallery. So we have this fantastic uh, unique local product. So it was used in our modernist designs and it was used in so many buildings from the 1950s right up until today in 2022. And we started to notice that a lot of the designs here in Winnipeg are very warm and welcoming and they do reflect our city and they reflect how friendly and welcoming our, our people are. So the feedback has been very positive. We've been very excited to launch this exhibit. We wanted to make sure that it was publicly accessible and free of charge. So anybody can come down to Union Station here during the station hours to view the exhibit. It. and we just wanted people to be able to understand and appreciate the diversity of architecture that we have here in Winnipeg. So going through the exhibit, we go through each decade of the Queen's reign, right from the 1950s up until the 2020s, and we selected the best buildings or some of those prominent buildings that really do define what a modern Elizabethan era would be here in Winnipeg. The Queen visited Winnipeg six times, which is actually a lot more than most major world capitals. She visited Winnipeg more than Washington, D.C. She visited Winnipeg more than Paris, France. So it is actually quite special that the Queen was very fond of Winnipeg and it held a very special place in her heart. And we also looked at her many tours here. She visited almost once every decade. And when she came here, she met with many people and many local organizations. And it's clear that she was very fond of Winnipeg because the very first royal designation, so a royal designation is the personal wish or the personal choice of the monarch. And she decided the very first royal designation of her reign back in 1952 was bestowed to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. One of the very last royal designations that she granted as part of uh, her reign was back in 2014, and that was to our Aviation Museum, which is now the Royal Canadian uh, Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada. So we're very excited because the exhibit is fully bilingual. It's been translated uh, uh, for French and English, and the front and back of each panel makes it accessible to many different audiences. Starting here in the 1950s, uh, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in 1952, uh, which is actually a very uh, prominent moment in Winnipeg's history. Uh, after the early 1900s, after the first kind of economic troubles in Winnipeg's history, the 1950s post-World War II saw an immense amount of growth here in the city. And along with that growth was a lot of new architecture and a lot of new designs. And this was also one of the first moments where we had a lot of uh, young local architects graduating from the University of Manitoba and building buildings right here in the city of Winnipeg. So we have some fantastic examples here in the 1950s, including the Norquay building down on York Avenue. And you see a fantastic example of a very modernist building. The facade is very modernist, but tied in with the Tyndall stone right down the side. So you just, you have this blend of modernist architecture with the traditional Tyndall stone uh, material that's mined here right in, in Manitoba. And Queen Elizabeth uh, visited the city twice in the 1950s, first as Princess Elizabeth before coming to the throne, and second as Queen Elizabeth in 1959. And she visited many organizations, including the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, which was the very first organization to receive a royal designation under her reign. The 1960s was another very special decade in Winnipeg's history. 1967 saw the Canadian centennial ce celebrations for uh, 100 years since uh, Confederation. And uh, linked to the, those celebrations were a lot of major projects, including here in the city of Winnipeg. We had the new uh, Winnipeg City Hall, the Civic Complex, 
that was completed in 1963. We also had the Manito Man Manitoba Centennial Complex, which was linked to both the Canadian Centennial in 1967 but also the Manitoba Centennial in 1970. So Queen Elizabeth came to Canada again in 1967 to participate in a lot of the festivities. She didn't come to Winnipeg, she sent her husband, uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, but she returned in 1970, so, so very close to these celebrations, um, to celebrate the Manitoba Centennial in 1970. And so we have some fantastic examples of architecture from that time, including pieces that are still used today, such as the Pan Am Pool on Grant Avenue, which is a fantastic piece of architecture, but it's also still a fantastic pool that is still well used by Winnipeggers of, of many generations. So um, in 1967, uh, having Queen Elizabeth as part of the, the the celebrations on Parliament Hill was a very special moment because it was this idea that Canada had just reached a hundred years old um, but obviously it's a very uh, steeped in history and, and linked to a lot of history so to have Queen Elizabeth here join in those celebrations I believe it's still the world record for the world's tallest cake that she cut. Um, it was a very special time. And then to have her return to the province of Manitoba in 1970 for our own centennial celebrations. She did an extensive tour throughout the province visiting many different regions. And there's a famous story of how she spent the night at a rural Manitoba farm because she was looking for, uh, her and her family were just looking for kind of a, uh, a break from the, the grueling uh, Cross Canada tour. And she was able to relax and there's photos of her on very normal lawn chairs, eating at a barbecue and, and riding horses. So it, she has a lot of deep, had a lot of deep connections across that, this, this province. And those were forged by such uh, you know, incredible tours such as in the 1960s and 1970s. So the 1970s, as I was talking about previously, saw the return of Queen Elizabeth to Manitoba for an extensive uh, tour of the province to, to celebrate the centennial. And as part of that, there was a lot of iconic uh, architecture, architectural projects that, that opened in Winnipeg, including the Winnipeg Art Gallery in 1971, which is a fantastic piece of architecture right on Memorial Boulevard and, and very unique in its design, almost as an iceberg rising from the street completely clad in Tyndall stone and opened by the Queen's sister, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret, Countess of Snowden in 1971. And as you know, many visitors will know, it's a fantastic uh, art gallery, but it's also a fantastic piece of architecture. As well as we have the Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre, which received the Queen's Royal designation in 2010. And that was a very special designation because again, to stress that these Royal designations are actually quite rare and they are on the personal um, choice of the monarch. And so the, the, the Queen had to uh, personally want to bestow this Royal designation on this organization. And it's quite special that she chose Manitoba's theatre company, the Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre, to receive that designation. The Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre opened back in 1969, which is a, um, or sorry, 1970, so right at the end of that 60s, 70s, done by local architects. And it's a fantastic piece of architecture that's very unassuming from the outside, but has very clean lines and is very warm and inviting when you walk into that space, especially in the middle of winter. You know, many Winnipeggers have memories of going to shows there and going into the, the theatre. It is quite a very special uh, experience and also a fantastic piece of architecture. Yes, when you have royal designation, you know, some people I've read, they call it the world's best marketing, but it's a lot deeper than that. Having royal designation means that you know, it has essentially the monarch stamp of approval. It means that the organization, it's not just about the building, it's about the organization that inhabits that building. It means that that organization is doing very important and very necessary work and worthy of that recognition because a royal designation is recognition of very hard work, very quality work, and just it gives that stamp of approval that says this is worthy of the monarch's personal royal designation. And so to have so many buildings opened by the Queen and so many organizations here in Winnipeg that have been granted royal designation it's quite special when you think of you know, how many 
um, places around the world that might have requested it and how many did not get it. But here in Winnipeg, we're blessed with many organizations and many buildings with the royal designation. It's very important because Winnipeggers are very humble and I think a lot of that stems from people being so humble and taking what we have for granted. I mean, we're, we're surrounded by beautiful buildings. Here in Union Station, a lot of people don't recognize that this building itself was built before Grand Central Station in New York by the same architects and this is a very, you know, fantastic building and for a city our size, we technically really shouldn't have such quality, amazing architecture. And yet Winnipeg always punches above its weight and Winnipegers take it for granted. And Winnipegers don't necessarily like the spotlight, so it's easier to be able to say, oh, we're a forgettable city, or you know, I don't see what's so special about Winnipeg. But that's, I think, because so many people take what we have here for granted. When you travel to other cities and you start to recognize that even Calgary, Vancouver, or Toronto, they don't have the same level of historical buildings that we do. Here in Winnipeg, we have the Exchange District, which is a national historic site almost any other city in North America demolished those buildings back in the 1970s and the 1980s. But Winnipeggers who were very passionate about architecture and about history fought to save it and now it's a National Historic Site. So when you just see the diversity and the amount of historical architecture that we have here in Winnipeg, it's very easy to take it for granted because you pass by it on a daily basis. But if you critically step back and analyze what we have here, it's very important and I think it becomes very evident at, at how special Winnipeg is and how special Winnipeg was to the Queen. So starting in the 1980s, the city's growth uh, did slow and there was uh, a uh, prolonged kind of um, lull in, in the building in Winnipeg. But what that meant was sometimes bigger projects took took precedent. So there were some big projects done, such as the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. They had been performing out of Pantages Playhouse Theatre, as well as the Manitoba Centennial Concert Hall. But in 1988, they received their very own dedicated building and, and uh, rehearsal space, which is located on Graham Avenue here in Winnipeg, designed by a local uh, architect. But we also started to see the emergence of uh, landscape architecture, such as promenade taché. So this idea of creating an outdoor space and realizing that people do not just dwell in buildings, people also dwell in parks and, and very nicely planned outdoor spaces. And Promenade Taché opened in 1984, and the Queen officially opened it as part of her visit and unveiled a Tindallstone plinth uh, that is still there today. And it's quite exciting because just a few years ago, the city of Winnipeg added more to the Promenade Taché by adding some walkways and some viewpoints out onto the Winnipeg or out onto the Red River. And it's a beautiful, beautiful view of the Winnipeg skyline, especially at night. The 1990s is a much more recent decade for a lot of Winnipeggers. And it's a fantastic example, once again, of looking at spaces beyond just buildings. So looking at the Forks historic Port and the Forks development here in Winnipeg, just steps here from Union Station. It's a fantastic example of taking a very historical site. Um, it's been a gathering site for thousands of years. Then it was this uh, modern hub of the railway throughout the 20th century and taking this site and returning it back to the people. In uh, 1990 and 1991, the historic port opened, which Queen Elizabeth uh, visited in the following decade. But we have some fantastic examples here of just outdoor spaces that people can, as Winnipeggers, relax and enjoy, such as Leo Mole Sculpture Garden at Assiniboine Park, as well as here at Odina Celebration Circle, which is a beautiful, beautiful example of uh, indigenous landscape architecture and this idea of having a central gathering place uh, in the fork site which has been a gathering place for for thousands of years. It's a very sacred relationship because Queen Elizabeth um, oversaw the decolonization so under previous monarchs such as Queen Victoria we saw the colonization of Canada but Queen Elizabeth actually oversaw decolonization around the world. She was the one that personally advocated for uh, moving away from this idea of a British Empire into the idea of a Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth was actually one of her uh, most enduring legacies is that she wanted people from many different nations and many different corners of the world to come together for common goals. And that's hence the name, the, the Commonwealth. But here in Winnipeg, you know, the indigenous community uh, has seen horrible atrocities through the, the, the process of colonization. But Queen Elizabeth 
took a lot of time during her visits here to meet with indigenous organizations, to, to meet with indigenous leadership and, and, el and elders. And it is a very sacred relationship between the crown and indigenous peoples because it's a crown to crown relationship. And when uh, colonization was occurring in the 18, 1700s and 1800s, there was the idea that there had to be a treaty and it was the monarch that stipulated that you couldn't just come in and take land away there had to be an agreement and of course there's been atrocities and there's been you know a, a lot of the, the 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 intent of those treaties and agreements have not been held up but there is a spirit of a crown to crown an equal partnership that we're now starting to go back to those treaties and rediscover how can we uphold those treaties better and also how can we uphold you know our governments to make sure that they are that they're carried out in the original spirit to make sure that people truly um, have an equal partnership in the opportunities in the land hi uh, my name's uh, Andy Coons um, I came here to see the, uh, the exhibit uh, on architecture and the influence of Queen Elizabeth. Um, interested in architecture for quite a long time and have some background as I've worked in the industry, not as an architect, but you know, I enjoy architecture. I've made, a, made an effort in my life to kind of see places of that, you know, of that nature. So um, I've enjoyed this very much exhibit. I found uh, uh, quite good and I've seen some of the work from uh, the company that I had worked for many years ago, so that was kind of nice to see as well. I enjoy finding out historically the connection between some of the architecture that we have with architecture in other parts of the world. Um, when I had worked for uh, an architect many years ago, they were very keen on you know, understanding themes from other countries and from, you know, uh, developing and then transposing them to um, a prairie situation here in Winnipeg. So I found that quite valuable. And it opened up my eyes significantly when I was looking at architecture that I could see, okay, I could see a theme there. I, you know, I could, I, could, I could understand that, you know, there are, there's precedence in other parts of the world. I was looking at architecture here which has some similarities to Lincoln Center in New York as an example. So there's themes running through in terms of design that you can actually see here in Winnipeg. So we're not so disconnected or so remote as we think. Most of the architects that are practicing here uh, that are mentioned uh, in the credits to some of the pictures that they have, um, you know, they had their education and they had their exposure and their inspiration by most of the, you know, some of the biggest names in architecture around the world. And we see some of that here. So it was very positive. And that's one of the reasons I came out is to just kind of, you know, here's some better examples of, you know, as the Queen's reign progressed from the 50s through uh, recent days, is to the, the impact that it had. So it, 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 was, it was quite eye-opening. I did enjoy it. It, it, it's important for I think most people to know that when they come to a place like Winnipeg, which is, you know, relatively remote, nothing's really that remote these days, but something that's a little further afield, that we do have a connection to the rest of the world. There's a number of things that we, you know, the buildings that we do, the themes that we do, the you know, the effort that we make in in in, in various various aspects of design that they may have been familiar with, they may have seen. So you know. I guess there'd probably be a significant influence from people living in Europe because you're going to see some of those design principles here. Um, but for somebody that's coming in that hasn't seen it, it's important for them to realize that we do have roots here and these roots are very seriously, like the people that developed and did the architecture were really well connected. They understood architecture in various countries. You know, they didn't just look at what was local or Canadian. They were all over the world, at least in my experience. When, when, I, was, uh, when I was a child, I was born in, in, in 1960 and was a small child, seven years old at the, uh, at the time of our uh, 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 centennial, uh, Canadian centennial. There was already a bit of a, you know, a pride in Canada that sometimes expressed itself as a bit of a bit of resentment toward royalty. Hey, we're, we're standing on our own. We shouldn't really have to have, you know, all of these things. It's not that big a deal. I think the connection with the with the new king, uh, uh, King Charles, um, I think is going to be where's he going to take it from here? Okay, his, his you know, his his mother did a number of things, probably very positive. 
There's a number of issues that probably have to be addressed by the royal family related to our history and the history of various various peoples here. Um, but I expect he's, you know, he hasn't he hasn't had the job for more than three or four months, so he needs to kind of grow into it. So it's hopefully that he's gonna he's gonna have a positive impact. Uh, you know, in speaking recently with Indigenous leadership and learning and understanding the, the deepness and the, the sacred relationship between Indigenous peoples and the royal family, and the fact that this relationship goes back so far, you know, it's a very historical and a very deep and impactful relationship. And it doesn't mean to understand, you know, or that we need to, you know, um, modernize and we, we need to recognize when things haven't been carried out into their original uh, intent. But speaking and learning and listening, you know, that is a big part of a uh, big part of history. But it's also how can we move forward? How can we walk forward together? You know, in a better understanding and in a better sense uh, as an act of reconciliation. You know, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee was very clear as to you know what has needed to be done, and part of that is just listening. And, and it's a you know it's a part that Queen Elizabeth was um, uh, very keen on. She was a, a, a very good listener, and you know met extensively with Indigenous people and communities across Canada from the north uh, to the both coasts right across the country. She met with a lot of different communities and, and wanted to get a deep uh, understanding as to what their life was like and to, to, to better understand who they, who they are as a people. In the 2000s we saw Queen Elizabeth's Golden Jubilee which was a celebration of 50 years on the throne. And she came to Winnipeg in 2002 as part of a very special visit where she rededicated and unveiled the Golden Boy on the top of the Manitoba Legislative Building. And there was a concert that took place on the grounds of the Legislative Building, which was attended by thousands of Winnipeggers and was a very unique opportunity to see the Queen in a much more relaxed setting and to, to enjoy a concert. But we also saw examples of fantastic architecture opening, including Thunderbird House on Main Street which is designed to look like an eagle with outstretched wings. And it's a very good example of Indigenous representation in our architectural landscape to ensure that the, the, the architecture that's being built reflects the people of Winnipeg. And I think we see that throughout the different decades. As Winnipeg grows and as Winnipeg diversifies, we see more and more different styles and representation in the architecture of the city. Manitoba Hydro Place has been called the greenest skyscraper in the world and it's quite special that we have that here in Winnipeg. It's a very, very environmentally friendly building which is quite interesting when we think now of King Charles III and his deep interest in the environment and, environmental and environmentalism. So it'll be interesting to see how architecture begins to change and yet we already do have some examples of some very green buildings here in Winnipeg. The 2010 saw some very iconic projects here in Winnipeg and one's that maybe people are more familiar with uh, open, such as our new airport in uh, 2011, which opened, and the Queen was the very first passenger through the terminal. Her and Prince Philip were the first passengers and signed a special book, but they also dedicated in a, uh, one, one section of the airport, which is now known as Queen's Court. She dedicated a very special time capsule, which is to be opened in 2065 and it contains a personal letter that she wrote to the youth of Manitoba. We also have uh, the uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which is an iconic building now on the Winnipeg skyline, which opened uh, here uh, nearby at the Forks and has become a leader in uh, advancing the idea of uh, human rights and examining uh, human rights, struggles for human rights around the world, but especially here in Canada. We also have redevelopments and as we move forward we realize that redeveloping what we already have can be a very green and environmentally friendly uh, way of building architecture such as even here in Union Station we saw a fantastic restoration of the station in 2014 and it's a beautiful example that the greenest buildings are the ones that we already have and so we can't keep building at the same pace that we've always built so the future of architecture will be really looking at how do we take the existing buildings that we have 
and repurpose them and do that before we keep building new all the time. And obviously the most recent decade being the 2020s that we're currently in, looking at what were the most iconic buildings in the last couple of years under the reign of uh, the late Queen Elizabeth. So Queen Elizabeth did die on September 8th uh, of last year and looking at some of the few buildings that have been built so far this decade, but specifically one, the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada, which was one of the last organizations to receive royal designation, just opened a fantastic, a beautiful new structure uh, on the grounds of the Winnipeg Airport which is a wonderful destination uh, for visitors to Winnipeg, but also locals to be able to go and check out our aviation history. We also have the Leaf at Canada's Diversity Gardens, which is a beautiful example of a building that is built and engineered to adapt and change to different weather patterns. And within that building, there's beautiful, I mean, we can all enjoy some, some warmer weather in the, the middle, of, middle of winter here in Winnipeg by just going into that building and checking out the beauty and learning about plants and learning about uh, the, the, both local plants but also tropical plants. So it's a beautiful way to spend an afternoon. And as a building, it's a fantastic piece and a very unique piece of architecture. And we also have the new Innovation Centre at the Red River uh, College downtown in the Exchange campus, which is a beautiful example of Indigenous representation in architecture and involving local architects and local Indigenous artists to be able to contribute to architecture and be able to contribute to this new campus building to ensure that the architecture remains inclusive and uh, represents the city that we are today in 2022. And as we you know, have said, uh, you know, the, the conclusion of the modern Elizabethan era would have been September 2022. We really do see that the designs throughout the decades are linked to international design movements. But here in Winnipeg, there's a very strong legacy of making sure that those designs are warm, friendly and inviting and that they use local materials and they're quite special examples of, of architecture and we're we're quite fortunate to have them here in Winnipeg. It was a very sad day I remember turning on the radio I was actually driving at the time and hearing of her passing the, the news was breaking and I saw many other people um, you know uh, people were upset people were solemn faced and I remember even the billboards across the city switched to pictures of the Queen and and there was a this common sense of, of sadness and I think a big part of it was because this is the only queen or the only monarch that most Canadians have ever known people around the world you know most people have only ever known the queen and this was this common uniting element both around the Commonwealth but even nations that doesn't that didn't have the queen as, as head of state there was this uh, shared grief, but especially here in Winnipeg with her many connections. You know, we saw many of the organizations that she granted royal designation to or many organizations and buildings that she visited. You know, we, we saw them talking about her legacy and the fondness that she had and, and just how genuine and, and how and just how how wonderful it was to, to be able to have her in Winnipeg for, for so many visits. Winnipeggers are looking forward with anticipation. Obviously, the coronation is coming up in this May. And I think Winnipeggers are looking forward with optimism uh, for the reign of King Charles III. And, you know, we've, we've seen that King Charles is very passionate about environmentalism. He's also very passionate about architecture and protecting historical buildings. These are all ideas that when he first talked about them back in the 1970s and 1980s, he was pretty much laughed out of the room. But as a society and as a world, we've come to a place to recognize how important and valuable those are and how, you know, if we're going to be solving things such as the climate crisis, climate crisis, we're going to need to talk and listen to Indigenous people and learn about how they learned from the land. You know, we need to be um, open and, and understanding and I, I, I feel that King Charles III, you know, has that. He's made it quite clear even on his past visits to Canada. Uh, him and the Queen Consort did visit Canada in uh, May of 2022 and they met with a lot of Indigenous and, and smaller rural Canadian communities to learn about and to listen about what, what's facing Canadians. So I would say that we're looking forward and we're, we're, we're anticipating you know, what, what comes next and I think we're all, we're all looking forward to that.
Everybody is welcome to come down here to Union Station during the station hours, which are 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. It is open later on nights that the train comes through, but everyone is welcome to come down to this exhibit and learn and read and look at Winnipeg's, Winnipeg's architectural history, but also the history of the Queen's tours to the city, and just to learn more about our city and to learn more about our history. It's been fantastic speaking with you, Zohar. I really appreciate you bringing this to your, to, your, to your viewers. And I really am excited for people to come down and to send us their feedback. The Winnipeg Architecture Foundation, you know, we are looking forward to engaging and learning and, and sharing the, the beautiful history of Winnipeg and our architectural history with Winnipeggers. So, you know, we're just, we're thrilled to be able to offer this exhibit and we're, we're very thankful for the support that we've received so far and the wonderful feedback that we've received from visitors. We reach the end of our episode. And as you see, it's many information we can get from this uh, exhibit. I uh, encourage many of Winnipeggers to come and, uh, and visit this kind of exhibit to understand more about our history, to understand our culture, how it's developed. Again, thank you for watching. If you like this episode, please like, share, and subscribe to see our upcoming episodes.